So happy that you're here with us this morning. Let's stand together and begin with some worship.
that shoebox is open, they're overjoyed. You can see them shouting, jumping. Oh, look at how much they are excited. This is the first time those children are receiving the shoeboxes. They are so happy. Every box is important because every box is an opportunity to tell a child about God's love, about his son, Jesus Christ. If you get the heart of the child, you will reach the heart of the parents, you will reach the heart of the family, and then you will touch the community. That gift box is the beginning into their hearts. Isn't it incredible how these gifts touch the lives of these children? Every year we see tens of thousands of children discipled, and we couldn't do this without you, so thank you for packing the boxes, thank you for praying for these children around the world. God bless you, and keep packing those boxes. Good morning, church. Yeah, it's that time again for Packing Shoe Boxes, an opportunity for us to share our love and a gospel and a message to all these children around. We've got empty shoe boxes in the back there that you can take and start filling up now. The uh, National Collection Week, when uh, we'll be uh, gathering all these shoe boxes, uh, will be uh, November 13th uh, through the 20th. But you can bring your shoe boxes in, put it on the table out there anytime that uh, you're ready for that. There's another way to send shoe boxes also, it's uh, doing it online. If you don't have the time or, or just don't feel like it's right for you to pack a shoe box, you can go online on Samaritan's Purse. There's a card also out there that you can find to pack a shoe box and they will pack it for you and you can just leave a donation with them. Um, I, we don't have a goal yet for this uh, year, but I think it, we would probably look for about 75 boxes from the congregation. So if we could do that, that would be uh, amazing, like something to shoot for, and um, that would be a, a great, great thing. The, um, there's one more thing, too, besides just us as a church. We're also going to be, again, the... Uh, drop-off center for the surrounding churches and individuals to bring boxes in on the, uh, from the 13th to the 20th. And we need volunteers to help us greet these people, to bring in the boxes, to pack cartons. And so their sign-up sheet is also outside on the table in the back. And change subjects a little bit. One more thing. Um, this is Pastor Appreciation Month in October. And so we've got uh, uh, Alan and Deb have been long-serving, dedicated folks here, and we just want to give you an opportunity to give them a thank you for something they have uh, influenced you with or, or taught you or just to let them uh, a word of encouragement there. So there are some cards in the back that uh, in the cafe area, if you would fill one of those out, put in the box, and we'll get that to them, and I'm sure they'll appreciate your encouragement there. And so thank you, Alan and Deb, for all that you do. Hi, my name is Cassidy Wilhelm. I grew up in Frederick County. I recently, one year ago, moved to Smithsburg. I work in Frederick County Public Schools. Uh, I work with kids that need that extra support in the classroom setting. Um, for something fun that I like to do outside of school is cookie decorating. I have a daughter named Belle and uh, two stepdaughters named Ashley and Taylor and my husband's name's Walt. I've been married seven years. If somebody were to ask me uh, what my life was like before Christ, I would say that I lived my life through other people's approval. In my childhood, I went in and out of churches. It was never really consistent. It was not, not something that was super important to me. And then after the passing of my mom um, is when it became clear to me that this is where I need to be and this is where I want to be. Earlier in my life, I was involved in domestic violence. And every time that I was in a situation where there was violence involved or there was um, police officers that came to my house. I always was reminded that um, God is there. And I always had that feeling that he was watching me, he was there, he was protecting me. 
and just coming into church is just no better place I'd rather be. This is this is what brings me joy in my life. So the reason I want to be baptized is because I've realized that I can't do this life without him. Um, it gives me a sense of joy and purpose and comfort knowing that I am closer to God. My name is Cassidy Wilhelm. Um, I am here today to publicly announce that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Cassidy, thank you for your testimony. So upon your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, in obedience to his command, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> amazing, amazing. It's awesome. Again, welcome. We're so glad you're here. We are a church that the unchurched love to experience, and we hope you find that to be true. Yesterday, we had a lot of fun. The kids loved, loved, loved the barrel ride that we were able to provide um, as our kids club represented, representing the church. Okay, we have the kids Bible club, many of you know, here on Tuesdays. Um, but there's a big kid here that really had a lot of fun. <coughs> Victor. <laughs> so Holly and I started off with the golf cart. It's a golf cart, and then there's three barrels hooked to it, and it's a ride, and it's so much fun. So Holly and I very cautiously, you know, slowly avoiding the little dips and the bumps. Along comes Victor, and the kids are like, yay! <laughs> He's like having a great time. He was cautious. But they went a little faster, and I think all the bumps and the dips, I think he hit them all. And the kids loved it. <laughs> so anyway, we had a great time. And we just hope and pray that, um, you know, we were able to connect with parents, and they know that we are teaching God's word to their children. And hopefully that will open doors for them to come to faith in Christ. All right. We have a mission statement. Let's say it together. Following Jesus changing together we have more fun stuff coming up friends giving yeah lots of good food all right so it is a turkey ham all the fixings and we ask you to help with that so it's on november 12th right after this service and out in the foyer you will see plates stuck to the wall so you take whatever you want to bring, take that plate with you, and that's your visual to remember to bring that on November 12th. And we're all going to have a great time together and, and celebrating what God has done in the life of our church and with one another and uh, lots of good food because I know a lot of you are good cooks. I like that. New members class. It looks like it's going to be the first Sunday in November, um, most likely. Still ironing out the details, so talk to the pastor about that. It will be right after this second service. If you're new to our church, we welcome you. We're so glad you're here. We have a gift for you in the cafe, so stop by there. Thank you for your giving. As God leads you to give, we are able to do various ministries around here and share the love of Christ with people, and that's, that's what we're all about, right? Rowing in faith together and then sharing that with others. So give as God has led you to give through the church website, the church app, uh, in mail, or we have plates in the back. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Father, for this time that we can celebrate being your children, celebrate you and worshiping you. Father, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross who said that the church is the body of Christ, who you, Father, put that together, and you have this body here in Smithsburg. Lord, we pray that we would be shining lights in this community. We pray that we would now, during this time, reflect as we hear your word preached and just examine our own hearts to see where you want us to change. And we thank you for that. 
Come Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So heads I propose to her, tails I don't. Order the buckler and shield and prepare for battle. Well, good morning. I'm Pastor Allen. Glad you're joining us. I don't know how many of you that are married. Your husband took that approach to uh, decide when to pop the question or not. Um, but at least he did it, right? However, he came, <laughs> came about that. This is the uh, final week in our series called Divine Direction. And today's topic is faith to start. I want to start with a couple of common sense statements, if you will. The first one's this, to step towards something new, you have to step away from your norm. You have to step away from your security. You have to step away from um, uh, your comfort zone, we would say, to start something new. And that's not always easy. And then you have to start. So it's often the start that, uh, that stops us. You can, whether it be something big or small, whether it's something like uh, our finances. Uh, we're going to teach a finance class next year probably, and some of your finances are out of control, according to statistics, most of us. <laughs> and um, so if you take a financial class, you have to start by actually doing some of the things. And there are steps and to what's the first step and what's the second step. And if you don't start, if you don't do the first step, you're never going to get to the second step. It may be something involving uh, diet or exercise. Uh, it's easy to say, well, I'll start, I guess now we'd say, after the holidays. <laughs> uh, and then after the holidays, there's another reason. The start is often what stops us. So the conclusion we, you would come to is this. You'll never finish anything if you don't start. Now, what's the best time to start? Well, the best time, assuming as you can, is now. It's not to wait to the first of the year to work on your finances or your, your health or your relationship or whatever it might be. <clears throat> so we're going to look at a guy from the old, in the Old Testament. His name is Nehemiah. And we're going to look at some of the things he did. We're also going to kind of review what we talked about last week at the same time. <clears throat> so Nehemiah lived in Babylon. He was a Jew. What happened was 140 years before the account we're going to look at, uh, Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple was destroyed, the, the most uh, young and brightest Israelites were carried off to Babylon. All right. About 70 years later, some of them went back to Jerusalem, and then 70 years later, we come up with the incident we have today. Uh, Xerxes is the king, and Nehemiah is serving the king. So, let's pick it up in the third verse in the first chapter. At this point, Nehemiah's brother and some other folks had left Jerusalem and came back and gave him a report, and here's what they said. Things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. It's been 70 years. Things still aren't going well. They're in great trouble and disgrace. What's the trouble? The walls of Jerusalem had been torn down back 140 years ago, and the gates had been destroyed by fire. Now, we don't think it's a big deal, but that was their security. They didn't have a police force or whatever. So you lived inside the town. You had walls and gates to protect you. So they were without protection. And the temple had been destroyed and not be rebuilt, so there was disgrace. You know, their God hadn't allowed them to, or they hadn't been allowed to rebuild the temple, the place of worship. So what is Nehemiah's response to this? Well, the text tells us. <clears throat> when I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned and fasted. We have a term for this. <laughs> it's on your outline. He had a divine burden. There was something going on that he 
couldn't let go of. He couldn't say, that, that's not okay. Somebody needs to do something. Something has to change. Uh, and again, it was a burden. He, he wept and he fasted. Um, so what's significant to us when we talk about divine direction is your divine burden often reveals your divine direction. Um, talked about Operation Christmas Child. <clears throat> Actually, it was um, Franklin Graham. Back in the 90s, there was this war going on in Bosnia, and he said there was lots of children there that have a need. And so he spoke to a pastor in North Carolina and asked if he could put some boxes together for these children in Bosnia. Several thousand boxes this one church put together. And it's blown to, up to, I think, with close to a billion boxes have been given out over all the years between then and now. Uh, Franklin Graham got a burden. Um, doesn't have to be huge like that. Um, Holly does the daycare here. She had a burden for the kids in Smithsburg having a place for parents to have a place for their kids, safe, a good, safe place. And so now there's this child care in two places. Um, it could be something personal for you. <clears throat> for me, of course, it was back a long time ago when I had this burden not only to preach the gospel, but also to share it in another country. And we were missionaries for, for some time. It might be a burden uh, for children. Um, we did uh, foster care at one time. I, we couldn't foster care all the kids, but we could foster care some of the kids. Now we do uh, adult foster care. Um, God gives us all burdens for certain different things. I don't know if softball is a burden, <laughs> but we have someone who has a softball ministry. Um, <clears throat> so, your burden often reveals the direction God wants you to go. Now, we talked about last week, you're trusting God's process. So, we used the term last week, spirit's prompting, divine burden. Paul used the word compelled by the spirit. This is something you just can't let go of. It's not fair. It's not acceptable. Uh, something needs to change. So what do you do on your outline when you have this kind of burden? And what did <laughs> Nehemiah do? Well, first thing he did was he took it to God. Let's read that verse again. I heard this. I sat down and wept. For days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. So I didn't want to take up the space on your outline for the prayer, but I thought I'd read you a prayer. Some of you don't know how to pray or you feel like you don't know how to pray. Well, one thing you can do is you can pray prayers that are in God's Word. You also can pray Scripture, verses in God's Word. So let me read you his prayer. O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands. Listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people Israel. I confess... Confession is a good part of prayer, necessary part. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We all have sinned, right? We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees, regulations that you gave to our, your servant Moses. Please remember what you told your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. That's exactly what happened. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, then even if you are ex exiled to the end of the earth, which probably seemed like <laughs> we're in, in Babylon, I will bring you back to the place I've chosen for my name to be honored. The people you rescued by your great power and strong hand are your servants. O oh Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those of us who delight in honoring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. And so, he prayed. Now, Nehemiah had a job. He had a job working for the king. He's called the cupbearer. You know what the cupbearer's responsibility was? Kind of a cushiony job, except for one kept kind of 
difficult caveat. You tasted the wine before the king got to drink the wine. Now, why would you do that? Because if somebody was trying to poison the king, they would poison you instead of the king. That's a pretty severe caveat, right? Fortunately for Nehemiah, it never happened. So he's in the king's presence every day, and he's a Jew. <clears throat> and so the king uh, says to him one day, hey, Nehemiah, now, it wasn't the next day. I always kind of had my mind, I thought it was the next day. Uh, they came in late fall, his brother, to give him the report. And as we read the text, it's going to be early spring when he talks to the king. So several months have gone by. And the king says, why are you upset? You're usually not upset. And he said, well, the text says he's, he's afraid to tell the king, uh, most powerful person in the world. Uh, but he says, okay, he prays and says, okay, um, I'm a Jew, and as you know, some of uh, my homeland is in, in Judea, and Jerusalem's the capital, and it, it, it's in ruins, and it, it, it's a burden to me. I, I'm sad about this. I wish, we, you know, it was different. <clears throat> and the king says, well, what can I do to help? I'm the most powerful person in the world. How can I help? And he said, well... If you really want to help, would you allow me to go back and supervise rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem? Now, we have no idea that he has any skills with building walls, which is interesting about your burden. It doesn't necessarily something that you know how to do or that you're good at. And then he says, okay. He asked him how long you're going to be gone. The text doesn't say his answer. We're going to find out how long he was gone. But evidently, it was acceptable to the king. And then he said, oh, well, by the way, can you send uh, letters of authority and recommendation? Uh, oh, oh, by the way, can you provide uh, lumber for building the gates? And uh, oh, by the way, can you have some soldiers escort me all the way? It's 850 miles. Anyway, the king granted all of this. So on your outline, when God gives you a burden... It's because he trusts you to do something about it. He trusted Frank and Graham to start the shoebox ministry. He trusted Nehemiah to do something about the walls in Jerusalem. And when you have a divine burden, God's trusting you to do something about it. Not alone necessarily, but to do something. So we're going to break this down into three points. How do you do something big? Because this is a huge task, right? We've been to Jerusalem, <laughs> the big wall, but we build them. It's just, even today it seems like a big task. And so the king gave him authority. So he started small, started with authority from the king. Then he traveled, not such a small thing, but he traveled to Jerusalem. Now, when he gets to Jerusalem, what's he do? Well, let's read this first verse. Sometimes we think God's not concerned about small things. Uh, Zechariah is talking about the temple. Do not despise these small beginnings. Everything starts with the first step, right? We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. So he rejoiced when Samaritans first started in the 90s, and he rejoiced in the fact that Nehemiah pursued his burden. Now, il illustration, those who had children. <laughs> when you're, before your children began walking, and the first day that they actually took a step, someone's described it as a drunken Frankenstein. I thought, that's a beautiful uh, way to describe it. Now, when you took, kids took that first step, what did you do? Did you scold them? Did you insult them? Did you say you're stupid? You can't walk properly? You can't walk more than one or two steps? No. How did you feel? And we've, had, we've got four children. We've experienced it four times. You're elated, aren't you? Because they took the first step, the small beginning. And eventually took another step and another step and eventually learned how to walk, right? So God is delighted when you and I 
pursue that burden and we take that first step. It may be shaky, it might not be great, but take the first step. So when he gets to Jerusalem, what's Nehemiah do? <clears throat> the, chapter 2, verse 12. I slipped out during the night, kind of secretly, taking only a few others with me. I had not told anyone about the plan God had put in my heart for Jerusalem. So he shows up, doesn't announce what his plans are, and he does a survey. Uh, he's traveled there's 850 miles, um, kind of looks around, see what things are, uh, how bad things are, uh, to really understand the task that was before him. That's important, right? And then he gathered the then he gathers the leaders of the town together. And here's what he says to them. You know very well what trouble we are in. It's obvious. The walls are destroyed. Jerusalem lies in ruins. The gates have been destroyed by fire. Let's rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. It goes on. And then I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been on come. He'd given me uh, resources. He's given me authority. He's given me soldiers to protect me. They replied, let's rebuild the walls. So they began the good work. So it began with a one person's burden. It began with one person's vision, which is interesting to me. His brother had lived there. He didn't come up with the vision. There are hundreds, if not thousands of people living there. They didn't come up with the, the idea. They didn't have the burden. God gave the burden to this man 850 miles away. And he was faithful to pursue. So, on your outline, you don't have to have the faith to finish the job. Huge job, right? Who knows it would ever be finished? But he had the faith to take the first step, to ask the king and then to travel and then to share his vision with other people. Notice, God doesn't give you all the details. God didn't tell Nehemiah about how many bricks he needed or stones he needed and mortar he needed and all the details. He just had a vision. And I got to think about this church. Um, somebody's here that was been here from the beginning. I don't know who had the initial vision for a church in Smithsburg. Uh, I do know somebody that lived here for 50 years, and she was a Baptist from North Carolina, and she wanted a Baptist church in Smithsburg, and she prayed for one for 50 years. And she, once this church building was here, the church existed before that, but the building was here, she was able to attend just before she died. Actually, her daughter uh, still attends here. So I don't know who had that vision. I know there was a Bible study group that met in Smithsburg, I know a lady by the name of uh, Lillian, um, she had a great burden for this. Um, she's no longer with us. She's gone to be with the Lord. Um, but we didn't have, and I came along pretty, pretty near the beginning. Um, but we didn't know the details. Smithsburg, where in Smithsburg? Uh, what piece of land? Or uh, some existing building. Um, once we had land, what the building was going to look like. And we added on multiple times. We had no clue about that. We had no clue about what this service would look like, these worship services would look like. And we had no clue who would be here and who wouldn't be here anymore, right? We didn't have the details. But that small group of people had the faith to start. Um, <clears throat> so last week we talked about uh, the... Uh, Trusting God's process, right? So there was the burden or the, uh, the calling. Secondly, we talked about certain uncertainty. So whether it was Nehemiah about the walls needed to be built or whether it was this group of people that a church needs, a Baptist church needs to be put in Smithsburg. Whatever it might be, they were certain of the calling, the certain of the vision, certain of the burden, but again, the so much uncertainty, where, when, how, etc. right? 
Always think big. It's big to build, start a church and build a building to, for it to meet in. That's huge, right? Always think big. But you just need the faith to start, to start small. I told you the story a couple weeks ago when I accepted a call to be a, I felt a, my burden to be a pastor. And I went to my pastor and talked to him. He said, okay, here's, what you, here's where you're going to start. And it was Sunday, my teaching Sunday school, so teaching God's Word, teaching the Bible to a group of middle school boys. Two of the boys were my brother and my cousin. Baptism of fire. Over the years, I've preached to hundreds, I guess, add them all up, thousands of people. But I started by teaching the Bible to three, four, five middle school boys. And it was nine years later before I became a pastor. So, start small. Secondly, to do something big, you take the next step. You start small, the next step is probably small, and the next step is probably small. So, he traveled there, he surveyed, he shared his vision with the uh, leaders of the town. But something else is going to happen that we talked about last week. Next verse, immediately. Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arab, heard our plans. They scoffed contemptuously. That's quite a <laughs> big term. Scoffed contemptuously. What are you doing? Or what do you think you're doing? You're rebelling against the king. Are you rebelling against the king, Dan? Now, he hadn't told, he had, they hadn't heard <laughs> that he had the king's permission. So we talked about that last week in that trusting God's process, there's predictable resistance. So Nehemiah, if he didn't know ahead of time, he soon found out. I think he knew ahead of time. That's why he secretly went out at night to look at the walls. There's going to be resistance. I don't know how resistance um, Samaritan's Purse has with giving these shoeboxes out. I know some places they can't do it. There's restrictions on that. I don't know how many restrictions or resistance came uh, from starting this church, but you can be guaranteed, as I said last week, if you're doing something God wants you to do, you have an enemy that's going to resist. And it's a good sign. It's a sign that you're on the right track. <clears throat> so, Nehemiah, I replied to these people. They're pushing back. The God of heaven will help us succeed. We are servants. We'll start rebuilding the wall. The start. But you have no share, legal right, or historic claim in Jerusalem. And I assume that's ac accurate. He had the legal right from the king to do what he was going to do. So, trusting God's process, we also talked about uncommon confidence. Now, it's amazing with Nehemiah, right? We don't know how much experience he had with this kind of thing. He just knew this. God wanted him to do. He shared his vi vision, and the people caught on. So, you too, I too, we need to take a step and have confidence in what God wants us to do. Let us become a pastor, uh, start a church, uh, do a ministry. Some of you in children's ministry, some of you in other ministries, whatever it might be. How do you become more like Jesus? Well, example, study God's Word. I, I came across a statistic that many of you, people in church, don't read God's Word on a regular basis. Um, trying to think of some way to encourage you folks to do it more. Um, but okay, you want to be more like Jesus? Start reading His Word. Start studying it. I uh, talked about this last week, uh, or a week before. Hang out with people that are Jesus followers. Have confidence that it'll happen. And thirdly, how do you do something big? <clears throat> Start small, take this next step. And this is a, kind of a no-brainer. But most of you know, and I've, done, I've ran these 50-mile races. Actually, it's coming up in a couple of weeks. I'm not, I don't do it anymore. But people ask me, how do you run 50 miles in a day? And this was always my answer. 
I just didn't give up. Except for the last time, I, my knee gave out. If you just keep going, eventually you get to mile 50. Whatever that burden God has given you, if you don't get up, give up, you finally get there. The building gets built. Uh, the ministry, the boxes get, get, get spread out. Whatever it might be. So, back to Nehemiah. <clears throat> if we back up, we're going to find out they started building in August. They started rebuilding the wall. Uh, there's, a, there's a two missing from the text. So on October 2, or the October 2nd, the wall was finished. How do I know it was August? Because it says 52 days after we had begun. Now, to me, this is mind-boggling. Um, to rebuild those walls in 52 days today would be difficult. And we talk about um, the resistance they got. It got to the place where half the people had to stand guard while the other half actually built the wall, rebuilt the wall. So after it was finished, what happens? Our enemies and surrounding nations heard about it. They were frightened and humiliated. Frightened because these folks serving their God, were able to do an amazing thing. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. Now, was the work finished? The wall was built. Was the work finished, though? No, the work wasn't finished. The, uh, the uh, I guess you say, the infrastructure of the city had to be rebuilt. The temple had to be rebuilt. Point being, are we ever finished? No matter what God's burden he gives you. No, we never finished. I, think, I thought about parenting. <laughs> For one thing, how many of you have taken a parenting class before you were a parent? Now, eventually you realize, I don't know what I'm doing, right? <laughs> and so you take parenting classes. But we had a kid, we didn't know what to do with it. Josh shows up and, you know, my wife babysitted, babysitted people as, uh, you know, as a teenager. Um, but you kind of learn on the fly. But um, do you ever finish being a parent? Kids grow up and leave home. Sometimes they come back, but anyway, they leave home. But you never finish being a parent. You're never finished being a follower of Jesus. Your burden may change. Um, the smaller task may be finished, but the bigger task is never finished. I love this quote from St. Francis of Assisi. Start doing what's necessary. You see something needs to be done, has to be done, you start doing that. Then what's possible? And suddenly, you're doing the impossible. Building the walls of Jerusalem. Passing out millions of shoeboxes. Uh, continue having a ministry uh, in Smithsburg, a church, a daycare in Smithsburg, whatever it might be. There's a verse that makes reference to this, and we're just about finished. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. Don't get weary about doing what is good. My wife got home yes, last night after ministering with kids in the afternoon and evening. She was tired. Is she going to give up children's ministry? I don't think so. No, okay, just check it. At just the right time, you will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. And she was sharing about one of the children with me, the uh, progress, you might say. Uh, one other thing before we finish. What will happen once you trust God's process? First, God will break you. God will break you. Whether it's, you know, calling to the ministry, whether to be start a church, whatever it might be. I'm, I was reading this through the New Testament, and these two guys go to, go to church, one of them's this really religious guy, and one's just this tax collector, this terrible sinner. And uh, the one guy stands up and says, "Thank you, God, that I, you know, I do all these religious things, and thank you that I'm not a terrible sinner like this other guy." <laughs> and the other guy, his heart was broken, and he couldn't even stand up, and he and he was prostrate on the on the floor, and he said. I'm a sinner, God, please forgive me. And then Jesus asked the question, who went home forgiven, justified? 
wasn't a religious guy. He wasn't broken, was he? He was a guy that was broken. So God needs to break us. And then secondly, we'll overestimate what God's going to do in the short term, underestimate in the long term. I remember when I started preaching. Small congregation, most of the people there were believers, and I would preach my heart out that somebody got saved that Sunday. And we used to walk down the aisle then, and nobody walked down the aisle. And I would do it again the next week, expecting somebody to walk down the aisle. Eventually, somebody walked down the aisle, but not every week somebody walked down that aisle. And eventually, uh, I got to think about this the other day. That church was about 30 people, and it was, when we started, six years later, it was about 70 people. The congregation almost over doubled in our time that we were there at our first church. And when I think about this church, I've been here a long time. I can't imagine, thinking back, how many lives have been touched, lives changed, just because some group of people were faithful and many people have been faithful over the years. So, next step, dream big. Dream God's dream. Start small. Take the next step. Let me pray with you. Father God, thank you. I thank you for the journey you brought me through. I thank you for the burdens that you give me to be in the ministry, to be a pastor, be a missionary, to pastor here, and lots of others. Uh, God, we thank you that you are interested, you desire for things to be different, to be better, and that you put burdens on different ones of us. Those that you trust will actually do something. So, Father, I thank you for those that have you have trusted and they've trusted you to accomplish what's been accomplished. And we pray as we move forward that, that those burdens will continue, the work will continue, and you will be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Pastor Allen. Let's stand together and sing one more song.